Amen. All right, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter number 12. I have been refreshed already. If I had to go home this afternoon and hadn't preached, the trip would have been worth it. I'm looking forward to the next couple of days. There's a couple of things I'd like to say. I'm going to wait and see if they find a way into the message. Um, really, I've, I've been writing things down. And uh, sometimes, well, maybe the Lord wants me to say that. And then maybe it's just something I hadn't needed to write down. But uh, I, I will say this. Only one of the great days in my ministry is when I realized that, uh, that God sent me to the place where I am to reach the people there and not to impress Bible believers somewhere else. Uh, the fear of man is a snare. And uh, we are all different, you know. There's, there's different members in the body. And uh, I'm, I'm probably the most different person here. Um, amen. <laughs> and and, and I've, I've changed, I've adapted, I, I've, I've modified, because... Uh, I finally realized that it doesn't matter what they think of me in Pensacola or in Hammond or any place else. What really matters is that, is that I, 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 I try to um, condition myself or, or, or pattern myself. I'm not trying to reinvent myself, but I'm trying to adapt myself to reaching the community that God put me in. And that's foremost to me. And so, you know, you might think that maybe I'm in a rut. Uh, in, in a habit of doing things, and, and probably I am. I want to be adaptable to where I go, but obviously you're going you're gonna to kind of be accustomed to certain things. And I, I've gotten accustomed to doing things in a certain way Amen. that uh, I think is just a better way for me to, to do them where I am. Uh, I'm all for, we have a camp meeting, and, and we get happy. But uh, I, don't, I don't think I want to invite a bunch of lost Catholics on Thursday or Friday night at my camp meeting. Uh, are you with me on that? I mean, if it gets loose and people are running the aisles and screaming and hollering and all that, I, I'm all for that. I think that's wonderful. I think God's people need to do that. But I think it scares the daylights out of lost Catholics. <laughs> and uh, I, I've got... I, Small time, but he's a, he wrestles on the side. I believe he's saved. I don't think she is. Believe it or not, I, I think he's saved. But since that time, uh, I was able to visit with them in the hospital. And, and they, you know, they're not coming to church faithfully every service or anything. But I, I'm, it, it's, a, it's been a long haul with these people. And uh, I really believe I'm, I'm seeing some things begin to happen now. And the amazing, you know, he told me about visiting a friend of his in Tennessee, a guy he grew up with and went to church with him and what happened there. And it sounded, what he was telling to me, I said, I'm thinking to myself, that's a service I would have liked to have been in. But it scared the daylights out of him and his wife. I mean, they, they, this, this is the weirdest thing I've ever, I mean, it was, you know, th to them it was holy roller religion and it was just a lot of strange behavior that really frightened them and made them very uneasy. But, you know, they were, when they came to our church, I believe God moved on their heart. He told, told me that I didn't see him until a couple days later, and he told me the first thing Tuesday morning, he, he said, thank you so much for letting me come. I said, man, you made my day. You come into my church, made my day. I'm so glad to have you there. And she said, oh, man, you know, Connie was just so moved by the whole thing. And, I mean, we, you would have thought you were in a Presbyterian church, okay? I mean, we had it planned out to the last word, practically. 
And uh, just, he said that the Lord just seemed to have worked on them. And again, you say, well, didn't they already get, I know you don't, guys, you're not in that crowd that thinks the minute you get somebody in the door, you give them a five-step plan and they're supposed to get saved that day. You realize there has to be sometimes sowing and watering and, and all that. And that's what's been going on with these folks. And, and honestly, uh, I, want, I, was, I was glad the way we did things when they came in the door. I really was. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's just what I have to say about that. But I, I want you to stand now, if you would, with respect for the Scriptures. And the next words that you hear will be those of Almighty God. Luke chapter 12, verse number 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. And uh, God shall add his promised blessing to the reading of his own infallible word. You may be seated. We prayed already several times for all the preaching, so I'll just go on. I call your attention again to verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's a very beautiful and, and comforting statement that the Lord gives right there. Amen. And words like that are often avoided by militant Christians. And uh, I, t I believe I am a militant Christian. I think of myself as one. But we understand that sweet passages like the one I read in verse number 32 are the favorite habitat of liberals and compromisers. And the way we put together, we tend to think, well, why in the world would I want to preach on Luke 12 and verse number 32 when I can preach on James 4.4? 4? You know, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye, not that, uh, or the, or know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. And why, why preach on something soothing like fear not little flock when we can ball them out good and proper? You see, uh, and I'm all for evangelists. We have evangelists in our church. Uh, I have evangelists come preach for me. But, you know, you guys, your job is to preach for results, isn't it? I mean, I think you're there to try and get an immediate response. Your goal is to do everything you can to get the people to move right now. I believe the job of the pastor is to feed the flock. And to just keep giving them giving them, giving them the meat of the Word and the milk of the Word and the apples and the honey and all of that and the bread of life to try and nourish them and strengthen them and feed them and build them up so that when they hear a rip-snorting, rip-your-face-off kind of a message, uh, they're strong enough to respond to it instead of just laying there inert. Now, we, you and I, uh, we know ourselves to be an army. And matter of fact, we, we take offense at any suggestion that we might be anything other than an army. But the truth is that sweet passages and tender passages like this one belong to militant, fundamental Bible believers just as much as they belong to anybody else that might be saved. And we might be an army, but we are also a little flock. And we militant Christians need to be reminded of the other as well. There are people these verses don't belong to. They don't belong to the unsaved religious pretenders that deny the deity of Christ or the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection or a blood atonement or a literal burning hell or the Genesis account of creation or the uh, uh, worldwide flood or the need for the new birth. 
they'll claim these passages and use these passages, but they don't apply to them. They don't apply to false professors with itching ears and spineless backs that think they're bound for heaven because they're nice people. God help them. They think they're sheep, but they're not. They're really goats. God help the wolves and sheep's clothing that prophesy smooth things and deceits to them so they feel comforted and keep coming back for more soothing lies. But folks, if these verses apply to anybody, they apply to us. We ought not let that crowd rob them from us. And a verse without a context is a pretext, you know that. And verse 32 by itself is just perfectly delightful, isn't it? Now, I don't think of myself as a sensitive modern guy. I'm not a flower sniffer. I, I couldn't care less about getting in touch with my feminine side. Uh, I free, freely admit that I love puppies, but I am intensely suspicious of cats. Amen? And I plan on staying that way. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, you know, uh, I'm not a Neanderthal. I'm not a Cro-Magnon man. Uh, I, I don't have any desire to shoot any living thing except for the raccoons that keep raiding my garbage cans. Amen? I wish I could get them in my crosshairs. <laughs> I'm not interested at all in shooting every animal that I see. I don't think that that's a, a, a proof of manliness. But I do eat meat every day without a twinge of guilt, okay? So I'm not a hopeless caveman, but I'm not a sensitive modern guy either. And I read this, and I have to admit, I get kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling from fear not, little flock. For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Uh, that verse suggests all kinds of peaceful calming, fuzzy, heartwarming images. But it does have a context. And I'm going to be a little bit of a spoil sport here. And we're going to look at the context and see just what goes along with this promise of the kingdom. It looks to me like the little flock that gets the kingdom is just that. A little flock. Now how do you know who they are? Well, you would have to know by how nice they are, of course. That's how we know the little flock. It's how nice people like us that like the sweet passages in the Bible that make up the little flock because we aren't mean and nasty like those Bible believers that like those awful verses like James 4.4 4. <laughs> or 1 John 2, you know, 14, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, I'd love to hear those verses quoted on a Christian radio station. You know, and now God's good news for today. <laughs> ye adulterers and adulteresses. No, ye not. That for, you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear, fear not, little flock. And you know, because those verses are worked the way they're worked by the crowd that loves them, we tend to avoid them. But let me say you are, I hope, Victory Baptist Church and friends of Victory Baptist Church, that you are part of that little flock and you can claim these verses. And I want to talk first of all about consolation for the little flock. You know, he does say fear not. The little flock will have their fears. And who's he talking to when he says fear not little flock? Well, he's talking to his disciples. And for all their flaws and weaknesses, they were not whining, head-pecked, mealy-mouthed, girly men. They were men. They were men's men. They, at least half of them were professional fishermen. At least one of them had been a freedom fighter, Simon the Zealot. Uh, one of them had a very unpopular job that subjected him to an awful lot of hostility and ridicule, but he did his job because he didn't care. He was in it for the money. And he didn't care about the ridicule. He didn't care about the opposition. In other words, these were not the kind of men who could not stand up to hardship. These weren't the kind of people that needed to be babied or pampered. Yeah. But it was to them that Jesus was speaking when he said, Fear not, little flock. Because see, he knew fear was coming. Maybe they didn't have anything to be afraid of just at that point, but fear was coming. You know, if there's any truly fearless people... Uh, they're among the insane. See those bumper stickers? No fear. N-O, fear. I want one that says K-N-O-W, fear. Because these men are about to become very fearful. 
fearful because of the fewness of their number. Twelve against the world. Fearful because of the large number and the influence of their opposition, their enemies. Fearful because of the immensity of the task that was set before them. And fearful because of the limitations of their own weakness and unworthiness. You ever look at the job that God set before you and thought about all the opposition to it? And thought about your unworthiness for it? And thought about your weakness to accomplish it? It's a little fearful. We're going to have to embark on a, a building program of some sort. We've got to pave a parking lot. You understand where we are? Uh, we've been on a gravel parking lot here for quite a while. And uh, say, so why haven't you paved it? Well, for one thing, it's expensive. And the other thing is, I'm not sure we're, I wasn't sure we are going to stay on that property. I was hopeful about relocating somewhere. We've only had enough acreage to actually develop and build something for about three years. We acquired another acre and a half uh, about three years ago. And it's been, well, what do we do with it? Do we sell it to a developer and relocate or do we develop where we are? And so I've been looking at all the other possibilities that have come along and I've chased every option. I've talked to realtors. I've talked to other pastors, you know, and talked talk to a Lutheran church about buying their school that they were going to raise and put in a subdivision where their school was. And so far, every door has been shut. And by 2010, we have to have a paved parking lot or we'll, really, we'll probably, I don't know if we'll go out of business, but it's going to seriously affect our church because we can't park on as, or we can't park on gravel after 2010. After 2010, we have to park on asphalt. You say, well, you know, what's that? It's $120,000 just to pave the parking lot where we are. I mean, 100 slots, $120,000. And I believe our church is up to it. I believe we can come up with it and all that. You know, but we've been through some battles in the last couple of years, and I've lost some folks and been through some hard times, and we're doing all right. We're not desperate, you know, but we've had a little bit of division and, and some conflict in the church, and, and I think most of those people are gone. And you know, it's an amazing thing. The Lord delayed us and delayed us and delayed us. And this Lutheran church that I mentioned, they're actually suing the city of Mount Prospect. They, sent, they spent, between themselves and this developer that they were working with, they spent $100,000 in developing plans for that piece of property, and the city of Mount Prospect just kept telling them, well, you're going to have to bring us more before we can tell you yo, yay or nay. You're going to have to bring us more, you're going to have to bring us more, you're going to have to bring us more. And after spending $100,000 on architectural drawings, then the city of Mount Prospect said to them, you can't do it. <laughs> And every time I've gone to them and said, you know, we're thinking about this or we're interested in that, they told me, well, you're going to have to bring us some architectural drawings. And every time I've said, uh, oh, well, uh, I think we'll wait a little while. <laughs> because it was just they weren't giving me much in the way of answers. Imagine that, $100,000 in architectural work, not a bit of ground broken. And that's why they're suing the city of Mount Prospect. But you know, now that they're suing the city of Mount Prospect, I feel a little bit more confident going ahead with building. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's in God's timing. Uh, you say, well, God's using this Lutheran church. And I sat in that pastor's office, and, and I didn't go in there to witness to him. I went in there to talk to him about the building. But you know, I, I noticed some books on his bookshelf that I recognize that are on my bookshelf. They weren't the ones by Hiles and Rice and Ruckman, but there were some books in there that I recognized. I'm not sure, maybe he might even be a gospel preaching Lutheran, but, but the fact of the matter is that that church is being used by God to put the city of Mount Prospect on their toes so they behave themselves a little bit more respectfully and thoughtfully of other people's money so that now when it's time for us to build and time for us to develop, we'll get some cooperation from them because if they don't cooperate with us, it's going to make the Lutheran church's lawsuit look even more valid. So, you know, it's just the way things have fallen out. But I look at that task and I think, you know, $120,000 for 100 parking spaces? That's outrageous. And then you look at developing the property that we have, developing the buildings. You can't build in Chicago for less than $200 a square foot. That's unbelievable. We need about 10,000 square feet. And I don't have that kind of excess income. But I am praying that God will, in the next three years, give us a million dollars above our projected income for the next three years. Amen. And that's just for the first million. <laughs> we need about two. You say, how are you going to do that? Well, I, I, all I'm saying is we're just a little flock. We're just a little flock. 
Is it all about parking lots? Well, I don't believe that asphalt is going to attract anybody into our building. But we, we work hard to get people to come to church. And walking through a mud hole will keep them away. Sure, they'll see that and say, well, I don't want to go to church here. You've got to understand the, the houses in the neighborhood where, where, where our church is, uh, the cheapest one that was sold recently was about $879,000. And they're buying quarter-acre lots with perfectly good three-bedroom ranch houses, one brick ranch houses with about 1,500 square feet and a basement. And they're buying those for $450,000 and knocking them down and putting up houses twice the size right where I live. And we're going to have a, a hillbilly church with a gravel parking lot. And praise God, he can meet with us any way we want to. But I'm not going to reach many more people than what I'm reaching. I've got to pray and ask God to see there's an immense task and there's immense opposition. You think about these bureaucrats that are willing to let somebody spend $100,000 and then say you can't do it. They don't care. It's a pretty immense task when you think about what the Lord's given you to do. I don't know what your assignment is, but I can tell you this. If you have any idea of what it is, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than you think you can do. It's something that you know is beyond the realm of your strength, beyond the possibility of you ever getting it done. It's going to require God coming through for you. If you're going to ever get that job done, fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He can do greater things through you than you can possibly imagine. The little flock will have their fears, but the little flock has their encouragement, and Jesus speaks to that fear. He knows what we need. And how many times in the New Testament do we hear him saying, fear not, fear not, fear not? About a dozen, which I thought it'd be more than that, but that's enough. The little flock will have their fears, but the little flock has their encouragement because the little flock is just that, a little flock. True believers have always been and always will be since the world began till Jesus comes, a little flock. Now I know it's kind of risky to preach about that because when you start talking about it being a little flock now this morning in this meeting, probably not too bad, but you know, when I'm preaching on a Sunday morning on something like this, I got people out there that, you know, tend to be suspicious. They've been listening to Christian radio all week long. Yeah. That's not my whole church. But I've got folks there, you know, that, oh, yeah. come, that uh, come Sunday morning. They're not Sunday night. They're not Wednesday night. They're kind of teetering in the balance. They haven't made up their mind whether they're going to be a full-blown King James Bible-believing, separated, independent kind of a Baptist or whether they're going to be a community church, yeah. modern Christian. Yeah. Now, they're coming, and so I want to help them. I don't want to chase. I could, I could run them off any time I wanted to. Matter of fact, I used to glory in that. There was a time in my ministry where, you know, that was the only thing I could really say good about myself was that I could chase anybody off any time I decided to. But you know, when, when you start talking about the fact that this is a, a little flock and not everybody's in it, people start thinking things like, well, this sounds like a cult to me. They think they're right and everybody else is wrong. They're the only ones that have the truth. How dare you talk about anybody else's religion? They think everybody's wrong but them. But you know, Jesus did say very clearly in the Sermon on the Mount, there's going to be many that are going to say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things? And by the way, they had a genuine worship experience. I believe it's possible to have a genuine worship experience and never worship the one true God. I'm not saying their experience is false. Their experience is valid. It's just a false God they're worshiping. There have been times and places in history when there's been plenty of professing Christians. After the Reformation, you know, and even before, especially before the Reformation, really, but even well into the Reformation, infant baptism produced a lot of professing Christians. They weren't saved, but they'd been sprinkled when they were babies. I, I rarely, when I'm doing personal work, ever have somebody say, when I, when I ask them, are you a Christian, have them say, well, I was baptized when I was a baby. But 30 years ago, I remember getting that answer often. Infant baptism had a way of contributing to the idea of people thinking they were saved when they really weren't. 
But you know, that's been replaced in our day with a self-esteem gospel yes, and a crossless discipleship. Yes, exactly. And you ask people today, are you a Christian? Well, of course I am. Why? Well, oh, because I love Jesus. You know? <laughs> and they don't, but they think they do. The gate's always been narrow. The way's always been contrary to human nature. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And by the way, uh, let, me, let me say this, that I think some of us have a tendency to think that there's people that, uh, that aren't part of the little flock that maybe really are part of the little flock. You know, virtually, you know, virtually every good man of God that I know, I mean, I'm talking about good men of God, virtually everyone that I know, if you, once I get to know them pretty well, I begin to see things about them that provoke me to ask, why in the world do they do that? Or how in the world is it that they can't see what I can see? And I'm sure that you're thinking the same thing about me. If you love me. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Amen? If you love me, you're probably looking at me and saying, why, why in the world would, can't he see that? Why in the world would he do that? You know, because and, and, I ask the same thing about just about every one of you. And other good men of God that I know and love and admire and appreciate and pray for and think the world of. And I think, why can't they see that? There's very few people, you know, that you're going to agree with 100%. But let me just say, among our crowd, you know, we're funny. We, we can shout and we can sing and we can cry out loud. But we're jealous and we're suspicious. We're the first ones to believe the worst about anybody else. We're temperamental, we're popish, and a lot of times we're lazy. So I suppose a little flock might be a little bigger than what you think it is. But it's not as big as modern Christianity imagines it to be. You know what's the best way of knowing the false from the true, who's in the little flock and who's not, is by their fruits, of course. And let me give you the fruit that's in the text right here. The little flock anticipates a glorious kingdom. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. They look forward to it. They're looking forward to something outside of this world after this life. And they eagerly anticipate it because of the things that they endure in this one. Like our brother that preached first this morning, brother Burning, is that right? Have I got that right? Brother Ron Burning, wonderful message, by the way, so refreshing, so sweet. But like he said, you know, heaven's looking better all the time. The things that they endure in this one make them more eager for the next. Because this one's under the control of the enemy. The Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 now, folks, that is not an Old Testament verse out of context. That's not an apostolic verse out of the book of Acts. That's not even uh, one of Paul's, you know, uh, early epistles, Romans. That is a Pauline verse from the end of his ministry. And it's either true or it isn't. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I believe it's true. Exactly how much persecution that's going to be cannot be known, but we are promised that we will know some. False accusation, ridicule, mocking, rejection, exclusion, backbiting, loss of employment, loss of income, broken ties with family members, to be despised and rejected of men, to be misunderstood by your brethren. You understand, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. How do you know the little flock whose father is going to give them the kingdom? They're the ones that are looking forward to another world, 
another reward, another place, because this one's in the hands of the enemy. Paul said, Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And he said in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, you endure troubles for Christ's sake, but they have a payoff. Every last one of them has a payoff. And the more of them you endure, the more you'll be rewarded. And the wonderful thing about it is, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He won't reward you reluctantly either. It's His good pleasure. When you get your reward, it'll be given warmly, gladly. Just like a father rewards his children in whom he's well pleased. You know, when my daughter went, went off to Bible college, uh, Excuse me, it just sounds like I'm bragging. I'm just trying to tell a story. But, but my, older, my younger daughter hasn't given me any trouble either. But my older daughter, honestly, she never gave me one minute worry. I mean, all the way through high school, I never had to worry about who she was with. I never had to worry about where she was going. She never one time gave me, I mean, I worried about her as a dad, worries about his daughter's safety and protection. But as far as her judgment, her friends, where she went, what she was up to, she never gave me one bit of trouble, one, not one serious problem all the way through high school. And when she went off to Bible college, I, was, I, I did a few roofs so I could get some money together to, get, to, to make the down payment on a car, and I carried the car payment for her when she was in Bible college, plus helped her not completely, didn't pay all her way through, but paid part of her school bill. She said, why would you do that? I, I was happy to do it. I got her a nice car, too. I got her a 96 Buick Skylark with all the controls on the, on, the, on, the, on the steering wheel, you know, leather interior. It was a small car, but it had a nice V6, a pretty peppy car. I drove it down to her. I dropped it off. I said, honey, you never gave me one bit of serious trouble. I'm happy for you to have this car so you can drive it back and forth to work. She's working to pay her way through school, you know. Instead of having to hitch rides with somebody else or beg rides, I dropped it. And I said some other things about it, too. A bunch of other people borrowed it and wore it out. But that's a, <laughs> that's a whole other subject. That's not what I bought, got it for her for. But I understand she wanted to be generous and she wanted to be thoughtful of others in that. And again, that may sound like, like bragging, but I was proud of her for, even for that. And it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, sometimes we got to provide things for our children, you know, that we kind of do it a little bit grudgingly. Hey, you little spoiled brat, don't you appreciate it? Why in the world would I want to give that to you? I know I have to pick up the bill because it's just one of those things, and, and I, I'm not speaking to myself very much here, but I know sometimes parents resent having to pay for things for their children because their children give them such a hard time. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You see, I, I, I hope you're a member of that little flock. If not, then you really do have something to fear. If you're not a little flock. If you're not part of that little flock. If you're not anticipating a future kingdom. If all of your affections and all your ties and everything that matters in your life is about this life and down here, then you're probably not part of that little flock. We're going to say a little bit more of that in just a minute, but, you know, you need to repent. If you sense God's drawing you to Himself, the Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. But if you're sure about it, if you know you're part of that little flock, then you have no reason to fear. It's going to get rough. It is going to get rough. You're promised that it's going to get rough but it's all going to turn out all right in the end. There's no real reason to fear. You can't scare me with heaven, right? You're God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And then, secondly, I want to talk about the identification of the flock. The consolation of the flocks, fear not, your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The identification of the flock comes in verse 33 and 34. I'm going to read it. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not. Where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Aren't you glad the word all isn't in there? 
He didn't say sell all that you have. Those instructions are demanding, but they're not impossible. What if he said sell all you have and give alms? None of us would qualify, would we? I think at the most surrendered point in my life is when I went off to Bible college and I was sleeping on cardboard boxes. I didn't even have a mattress to sleep on, but I had cardboard boxes torn apart with duct tape wrapped around them about that thick, you know, for a, for a cushion to sleep on. Everything I own could be tied on the sissy bar of a motorcycle. I've gotten a long way since then, but even then I still held on to some things. You see, it is possible to fulfill these verses to the letter. You can do it. And if you're in a little flock, you will do it. You'll want to do it. Thankfully, it doesn't say you have to sell everything and give everything as soon as it passes over your hands. But he clearly expects us to make some exchanges. There are some things we're to get rid of. And there's some things we're to take up. We are to give up some unnecessary things in this world for the sake of the next world. You know what he's saying? He's saying those that compose a little flock will have heavenly affections. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And they're investing in it in verse 33 and verse number 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's the key to the rest of his words. Now I confess that I get a little resentful when somebody that is living very much in this world appropriates verse 32 to themselves. The modern, streamlined, community church and community worship center crowd. When you look on a person's life and you see no cross, you see no sacrifice, you see no separation, you see no reproach from the world, you see nothing about them that is peculiar or that sets them apart from this world, I wonder how they can be so deluded as to think that fear not, little flock, could it possibly apply to them. They barely make it to church on Sunday morning once in a while. They have no service, no tithe, no offerings, no ministry, but they claim membership in the little flock. But I have to admit that when I look at these verses, I am provoked to re-examine my priorities and my motives. I have a pretty comfortable life right now. I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm really not. I, I don't think I've earned it. No, you know, all of us deserve hell. I understand that. I ought to be in hell with my back broke, as they say. That's fine. It's true. But I know some folks have made some investments, and every now and then God blesses them and gives them a little bit of a payoff. But I just hope that I am not deceiving myself about what I'm living for these days. God's given me some things and let me enjoy some things that I had to do without for a long time. But now I have them and, and, and I'm able to enjoy them, but I hope to God that's not what I'm living for any man, anymore. I look back over the last 30 years and I can honestly say that there have been times where I've given up some things and voluntarily done without things and lived in far less than ideal conditions on many occasions for the kingdom of God. And my family shared in most of that, if not all of that. When, my, I, when I married my wife, she was living a pretty self-sacrificing life when I met her. That's part of why I wanted to marry her. She's, uh, she's making about half of what minimum wage would have paid for a 40-hour a week, and she was easily working 60 hours a week in a Christian school, putting over 50, 60 hours a week in order to serve other people's children, who generally don't appreciate it, and uh, loving every bit of it. I don't deserve somebody like that. But you understand, she, she, I was drawn to her because she knew what it was to sacrifice and give up some things to be in the Lord's work. And then I look at this passage, and I know that the little flock is smaller than some professors imagine. And the language might be a little figurative there about selling all and giving alms and all that. But let me just say, if it isn't, a little bit moderated, we're all in big trouble. <laughs> the meaning is vivid. Those who belong to the little flock aren't living life for selfish purposes. Last week, in my, the week in my, in my church, 
before I preached this, the pre week before that, talked about seek ye first the kingdom of God, which is up there in a couple of verses before that. You know, and you need a job, but you need the right attitude about that job. It's got, you're not seeking employment for yourself, but you need to have a job so that you can seek the kingdom of God. You want to seek the kingdom of God in the job. Not that you're supposed to quit your job and expect God to supply every one of your needs. You're supposed to do your job. And then sometimes you need a vacation. <laughs> and you ought to look at your vacations the same way you look at your job. I don't live for my job. I don't live for my vacations. I take a vacation so I can keep doing what God wants me to do when I get home from vacation. Because I'm at a point right now, if I don't get away once in a while, I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to crack under the pressure. So every now and then, i got to get away. Why? I'm living for a vacation. No, I don't live for vacations. I take vacations so I can do my job when I get back from the vacation with renewed interest, with renewed enthusiasm, with renewed commitment because I get away from under the pressure. You know, if, if you want to know if you belong to Little Flock, I guess the best way to know, or the best question to ask is what do I love the most. Now, what do you profess to love? Because we all know the right answers. We know what to say. Uh, it's not even what preaching you admire. I know a lot of people, folks, let, let me, the, the, I've got to get away. This is something I really need to say. You know what, what the, probably one of the, I, the thing I mentioned there about not caring what the brethren thought anymore was a wonderful thing. Another great day in my ministry is when I got over being a bigot. Amen. God delivered me from being a bigot. Praise the Lord. That's a sin. Amen. Amen. And I got over that. Thank God. And a, another really wonderful thing about uh, something that happened. And I got to go back and see what it was. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, I, I saw a church that was under wonderful preaching. Great pastor. Great man of God. Great Christian. You know, and I, and I saw people that had sat under years, 20 years, decades, more of them, some of them more than two decades, under great preaching, behave like, well, I won't say like heathen, but not very much like Christians. Amen. And I mean, Bible believer, man of God, if I called his name, I think you'd figure it out. And I saw people behave in some of the most, I mean, I'm talking about people that were under wonderful preaching, behave in very un-Christ-like ways. Not act like Christians at all. And I looked at my ministry, you know, and I, and I was seeing some things. And about that time, I had just hired my first assistant pastor. I, and I was seeing some things that were really disappointing about my people. I, I saw jealousies. I never thought my people would be jealous like that. And they were so jealous. I got a very talented assistant pastor, uh, Matt Marshall, is my youth pastor. I mean, just a just, kid's got so many talents. And he's got God on him, too. You know, and I mean, that's rare. And good looking on top of that. I mean, you know, how many people, you know, talented, good looking and have God? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful assistant. I, I'm, but, you know, the jealousy was just, you just, you could just sense it. And it was weird because to some extent they were glad he was there. They appreciated the fact that, you know, that God would send him to help our church. At the same time, they were jealous for him. They're jealous about him being there and jealous for, you know, I wasn't making a hero out of him, but, but I was paying some attention to him just to try and get him over the adaptation curve of the first year of being in a new place, having packed up his family and brought him in. Strange church. He'd never been there before, and now he's, you know, somebody. I, there's a lot of, a lot of personal attention that he needed just getting adapted. And these jealousies. And I thought, you know what? I don't know anything at all about how to help people anymore. I, I looked at them and I thought, I've been preaching the best stuff I can find to you. And you act like a bunch of idiots. Yeah. Yeah. And I said that, you know, and I'm looking at this other church. That man of God preached wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things about the Christian life. And you act like a bunch of lost babies. And then I, re I came to the realization that King James Bible believers... Ruckmanites, separated into...